Hi, everybody. Welcome on to the old-timey wilderness trail that is the journey to cosmoerotic humanism, in which we track the evolution of Mark Gaffney's meta-theory through his responsive commentaries on his own texts. The first common component that we explored was the relationship between certainty and uncertainty. The second was the role of the uniquely divine individual soul print and its shadow, as revealed through the work of sacred autobiography. And today, the element of Eros makes its appearance via the text called The Mystery of Love. Now, the erotic element in all of its multidimensionality uh, has a lot of subconscious resonances and a lot of deep visceral issues for people both attractive and disturbing. So listeners and viewers should take care to gauge their own level of response, curiosity, and self-regulation, because who knows what Eris might stir up for you. <laughs> for those who are staying with us, let's dive in. Hi, Mark. Hey, Layman. It's great to be with you. And I love the hat and the shirt and the, the the beard it's a whole and the necklace a whole thing going on here right so i'm it's gonna be hard to focus on the uh the topic i do want to remind us that just for people who are following the series that we owe you a conversation particularly about soul print and shadow and what we decided is we would delay that conversation until we get to unique self and shadow because those are related conversations so there's a whole shadow conversation we haven't had yet and i look forward to having it so we got that bracketed into Eros we go, sir. Yeah. Beautiful. You know, reading this book, this is a bit of an oblique entrance to the topic, but I noticed the film Raiders of the Lost Ark comes up several times in this test. And is that just because of the presence of the Ark of the Covenant and the hints of ancient Hebraic magic? Or did Mark Gaffney really like that movie for some reason? <laughs> um, oh, my God, right? Um, I was not in love with the movie, I have to admit. Um, but I, how can you not like Harrison Ford, right, as uh, Princess Leia, right, knows because she was on set with him and had to choose a relationship, she says, between either Mark Hamill or Harrison and chose Harrison. So there we go for kind of, you know, irrelevant tidbits. So, so diving in, though, I mean, you've got this lost ark, right? I mean, the Ark of the Covenant. And, you know, one of my favorite allusions is Thucydides. You know, in the Peloponnesian Wars, you know, when he says, you know, when words lose their meaning, culture collapses. And when I was writing Mystery of Love, it was before I was, I'd read the Club of Rome material on the limits of growth and Paul Ehrlich, and I was familiar with the general conversation, but I didn't yet take the Metacrisis seriously. I didn't really take it seriously until 2009 or 10, when I started really focusing on it. So I was writing about Eros from the perspective of what does it mean to be a whole human being and not from the perspective of the metacrisis. My thinking has changed on Eros and, and you know, evolved greatly since then. But let's stay with Mystery of Love because I think that's our... So you've got this lost ark. The ark is the ark of the covenant. And literally today, you know, as, as you know, there's a thread we have of kind of some of the people in our inner study circle. So literally in this thread, just a little while ago, right? One of the people in the thread writes, I want to, I want to read it to you, right? He writes, um, let me just see if I can find it. He writes, um, right here it is. You know, you know, Mark's been telling us for all these years about the sexually intertwisted cherubs above the Ark and the Ark of the Covenant. But when I look at the actual text, it doesn't seem to say that. It just seems to talk about, you know, cherubs clinging to each other. And when I look for pictures, I get angels, you know? So that's what someone wrote in this, this text thread, which he's of course correct. In other words, this is a hidden textual tradition, but it's a enormously important one. In other words, anyone who's in the circle of the initiates, who's actually on the inside of Hebrew wisdom and is not reading it in its mainstream translations, understands that the Talmud in Yoma, Tractate Yoma 54, talks about Shnei Kruvim, two cherubs, above the Ark of the Covenant, and the voice of the divine in the Book of Numbers, the Noadati Lecham Bibin Shnei Kruvim, I'll meet you from in between the two cherubs. So the in-between space, the space in between this, this liminal space, the space in between, so the voice of the divine emerged from the space in between. It's in between the two cherubs. And the cherubs are meurim, M-E-U-R-I-M, it would be in English. Translated blandly by most of the English translations, 
But actually the word me'urim comes from the word er, which is the root word of erva, which is sexual, right? Particularly, you know, it will mean either the, the phallus or the oni, or er means arousal. So cherubs who are me'urim zebzeh are cherubs who are entwisted sexually with each other. And it's based on a text in the Book of Kings in which the cherubs are described as kim'or em ayin resh. Again, the ayin resh, two-letter root of er, kim'or ishul yoto, as, 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 you know, a man embraced entwined uliyoto with his accompanied partner. Right? And so there's an entire, I won't, I won't spend our precious time on, you know, validating this textual thesis. I, it was clear to me, I shared it with uh, Moshe Idel in the library in 2002, who's the kind of premier scholar of Kabbalah, was my academic mentor in the radical Kabbalah work at Oxford. Um, he completely concurred with the sources I adduced in the reading. We wrote Mystery of Love with you know, 30, 40 pages of primary sources. And Moshe told me then that he was going to write as well on Eros. And he wrote in 2005, three, four years later, right, a book called Kabbalah and Eros, in which he interprets the texts in the same way I do. Right, so so it's it's not a it's not a fringe interpretation. It's actually the only way to read these sources. So that's a very dramatic thing. So you've got the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy of Holies, Sanctum Sanctorum, right, the, the inside of the inside, and in the inside of the inside, you have sexually entwined cherubs, right? And it's very clear that the the tabernacle, which is where the Ark of the Covenant rested, which is a miniature temple. The tabernacle gets reenacted, rebuilt as the Jerusalem temple, first of Solomon, and then rebuilt by Ezra the scribe, which are the, the two temples, and ultimately destroyed by the Romans, you know, right around the time of Jesus. Right? The, the temple is the essence of the lineage tradition. And at the center of the temple, the temple has a courtyard, and then it has called the Chatzer, the courtyard, and then it has the Kodesh, the the holy, and then it has holy of holies, sanctum sanctorum, called the fnayul fnim, on the inside of the inside, or umka to umka, the deepest of the deep. And at the center of this temple, there's this epicenter from which the divine voice emerges, which is incarnate or visualized through two sensually erotically entwined cherubs. And so the principle of the mystery of love work, which was originally entitled on the erotic and the holy, which is now at a publisher in a rewriting mode, going to be republished as on the erotic and the holy. Right? The principle is not that the temple is about the sexual. The temple is about eros, and the sexual models the erotic. And so it's by identifying this quality of eros, and what we tried to do in mystery of love, and later in the book, return to eros, which we'll get to, which is a a reprise of Mystery of Love, but in a, in a much broader context, we identify Eros as the fundamental constituent of reality itself. And this is one of the first things when I met um, Ken, Ken Wilbur, one of the, you know, Ken had read an article I wrote on the erotic and the ethical, and someone made contact, you know, brought us together, and we spent seven, eight hours, our first conversation, talking about Eros. So Eros was, you know, this notion of Eros being central to cosmos. Is also something I, I tried to bring to the integral world in a particular way. In the end, we did something called uh, the integral spiritual experience on the future of love, where, where we articulated and deepened some of those ideas. But the, the notion, the core notion is that we live in a cosmoerotic universe. And it's very, right, right, the reality is cosmoerotic. And that's not a dogmatic claim. It's not a, a fundamentalist Pollyannish claim it's actually rooted in the best integration we have of the interior and exterior sciences. Reality is animated by Eros all the way up and all the way down. You know, in, in contemporary evolutionary science, you might say that the, the self-actualizing cosmos or the self-organizing universe, that old term by Jan how do you pronounce his name? J-A-N-T-C-H, right? It's 1976 book, which although it got attacked, but its fundamental core was, was accurate. This notion that reality is self-organizing, that it has obvious telos, that we go from quarks to culture, that we go from, you know, you know, slime, 
you know, to Shakespeare. We go from, you know, bacteria to Bach, right? And we go from mud to Mozart, right? That, that, that vector of cosmos, that self-evident eros, right? In which, you know, molten lava, you know, becomes music, right? And becomes ethics and becomes poetry. That telos of cosmos clearly is animated by some force, right? And we used to call it the fifth force. There was a moment where at the Santa Fe Institute, they talked about it as the fifth force, bad idea, right? And uh, my colleague, Irvin Laszlo, for a while wrote about it as the fifth force, you know, bad idea. And I think Irvin realizes that now as well, right? Eros is not, an, it's not a fifth force. It animates all the forces. That's a, quite an important distinction. Ken, for a while, was talking about a fifth force. So we don't want to think about it as a fifth force. We want to think about it as the force that animates interiors and exteriors, so whether it's the strong and the weak nuclear, the electromagnetic and the gravitational, right, are all animated by Eros, which moves reality forward, right, which moves reality to ever deeper contact and ever greater wholeness, right? And so it's such a such an essential realization. And then you realize, oh, okay, so reality is Eros, all the way down and all the way up the evolutionary chain, because right? that begins to make sense. There's 12 billion years of Eros before there's any sex. Big deal, right? Then Eros then explodes into a new stage of its emergence as the sexual. And the sexual is such a powerful expression of Eros and such an obvious one that it becomes the model for the erotic. And then we begin to realize, oh, okay, the sexual models the erotic, but it doesn't exhaust the erotic. We actually want to live in Eros in every dimension right, of our lives. And non-erotic living is always the source of ethical breakdown. And maybe I'll finish with this and, and turn back to you, brother, right? which is, and it's such a, a key notion. This is not an extraneous notion. This is not a kind of, oh, what, what an interesting side point we have here, right? Uh, you, know, you know, Gaffney and Lehman got lost talking about Eros. No, no, no. The core of ethics is Eros. In other words, all failures in ethics are rooted in a prior breakdown of Eros. Always, virtually without exception. You always say virtually because there's always, right? But virtually without exception. And as there's a collapse of Eros, meaning I don't have an experience of, let's look at the first four faces of Eros, of being on the inside, of fullness of presence of the yearning force of being moving through me, the evolutionary impulse, or of the wholeness of reality that, I'm, that, I, that, that lives in me and that I have access to. Or another word for wholeness would be the interconnectivity of the all with the all. So let's just take those four faces of Eros, each one which deserves conversation. But when I lose access to those, when I, when I don't have a feeling of, of fullness of presence, when I, I feel myself on the outside alienated, right? I feel ultimately that there is no inherent desire or longing or yearning which actually animates me, right? That's actually full and part of the wholeness of reality. And that's when Eros breaks down, then there's a sense of emptiness, but not in the Buddha sense, but in a, in a vacuousness. And I can't bear that. I just can't bear it. And I do everything I can to cover up that hole, that hole in my heart, that hole in the universe, and I cover it up with pseudo eros. And pseudo eros is every form of acting out, every form of addiction, every form of nefariousness, right? That exists in the Catholic church and it exists in integral circles and exists in new age circles and exists in Jewish circles, right? It's not nefariousness, nefariousness, where kind of human beings acting out of their base motives, right? As all the great traditions reminded us, right, is actually the default move of human beings until you train for goodness. And it comes from the sense of unimaginably painful emptiness. And I've got to cover that up. I cover it up with pseudo eros and pseudo eros always expresses itself as ethical breakdown. So it's, it's, so it's, it's an unbelievably central notion, which is, and, and this became, of course, we, you know, I picked this up much later with Zach and, uh, you know, in cosmorotic humanism, but the, the central enactment of ethos cannot happen without Eros. And if you try and bypass Eros, 
right? You know, for its, you know, surface imitators, then that feeling of, of, of the whole or of the emptiness at the heart of existence that lives in me becomes unbearable and I move to cover it up. And, and pseudo eros has so many distressing disguises, right? And of course, you know, so many ulterior motives are hidden, you know, under pseudo eros, right? You know, the, the most ulterior motive of all for pseudo eros is the ulterior motive of piety or the ulterior motive of integrity. There's many names we use to cover up, right? That which actually is just the gaping pain, right, of the emptiness. So what that means is, is that our highest ethical obligation is to live an erotic life. That's our penultimate obligation, right? The penultimate ethical obligation is to live an erotic life. And, and eros, of course, means one of the, the four qualities is wholeness. So it's part of, I, I'm in relationship to the whole. I'm not alienated from the whole. And of course, at this moment of metacrisis, right, the, the need to be omniconsiderate for the sake of the whole, right, to feel the wholeness within me is, of course, omnipresent and the most urgent moral imperative. We don't quite know how to do it because we're alienated from the field of Eros. So, so that's just a, a beginning of the conversation, maybe a beginning or a middle, but just to get a sense of what we mean. And so that's what Mystery of Love was about. That's what that moment in time was about. And I'd love to go anywhere that you'd like to go in any of the faces or any of the directions. Thank you for your patience. My friend. Yeah. So we're dealing with a Textually justified cosmic sexy liminal initiatic inter cherubic space that exceeds <laughs> ethics and exceeds emptiness. Okay. Well, even uh, Pascal has <laughs> said it here. Oh my God. Um, let me ask a question about terminology and arrows because it seems like there's this endless need to say, as you do in the introduction to this book, hey, the sexual model's the erotic, but eros doesn't just mean sex. It really has this ancient philosophical utility, this contemporary philosophical utility and cosmic significance. But why use a word that always needs that caveat? Wouldn't it be simpler to find some other term that isn't inevitably going to make people think about and even worry about sexuality and sexual motivations? Well, two things, right? One is we want Eros to actually allude to sex and we want to actually be in that tension, right? So in other words, we wouldn't want to find another word a, I, I'm going to come back to that in a second. Let me bracket that for a second. B, there's not another good word, right? And I, 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 you know, I spent a decade, you know, and if anyone would like to write in suggestions, you know, happy to entertain them, you know, flow, being a right. They, they don't quite capture it. Eros is a very, very beautiful word. In Hebrew lineage wisdom, the word that's closest, right, to Eros is Zohar. Z-O-H-A-R. And actually, Yehuda Libas wrote a very, very important article in Hebrew called Zohar the Eros, Zohar and Eros, in which he actually, both philologically and you know, thematically, conceptually, phenomenologically, right, traced the parallel between the Greek notion of Eros and the Hebrew wisdom notion of Zohar. And of course, he, you know, you know, there, there's two really there's more than two, but two in Israel, very, very, you know, beautiful scholars of Kabbalah. One was my, my mentor, um, you know, at least my academic mentor, you know, in that he, he provided the, the, the matrix for my, my academic writing, Moshe Idel. And the second is Yehuda Libas. Um, and Yehuda is a, we know each other only peripherally. We just actually exchanged an email a couple of years ago, but um, beautiful man. And has really focused his, investigations of the Zohar, which are enormously important, you know, on this, he has a number of terms for it, but it's basically on this erotic theme in the Zohar, right? And, you know, he, he's, it, it's enormously important. So Zohar, Zohar is a word that kind of holds that, right? But, but it doesn't quite capture Eros. But, but let's go back to the first point, which is, we need the tension with the sexual. And this is so important. We're so afraid of the sexual, right? And, and often someone will tell me a story and, and and it'll be a story because for whatever reason, because I've experienced, you know, false complaints in the sexuality and, and, and kind of some controversy around that. I know you weren't aware of that, so I'm sorry to share it right now. Um, but um, 
as my deadpan humor there, right? So, um, so, so lots of stories come to me. People call me all the time and I generally don't, don't entertain the conversation, but about, there'll be a story about somebody who was having sex with someone that people aren't aware of. And they're always central people. And they think that I should somehow be interested in that, which I'm not right. But, but generally, right. I say, okay, so, and, and their point is no, no, but there was sex. I say, so, so, so we've literally identified the sexual with its pathologies, that sex was had. I didn't, you know, this has been pointed out by a number of scholars. Um, there's a, a fabulous scholar at Yale, right, who pointed out that the original set of sexual harassment laws were essentially trying to protect against harassment. And what actually happened was the issue became not harassment, but sexual. So in other words, there'd be major harassment, men on men, right? But it didn't have a sexual nature, but it was like massively violating of all sorts of torts and laws, and it would be ignored. But if there was some shred of the sexual, right, with that, with, with, with you know, enormously complex contesting views, somehow there would be immediate convictions because we've actually inherited, right, a, a very profound confusion around sexuality. We have this, this force, which is the most powerful, obvious force in our own personal lives. And yet we have no story of the sexual, which is equal to our experience of the sexual. And so we'll come back to sexuality when we get into cosmoronic humanism and particularly the book Return to Eros. And we've now written 14 volumes on a phenomenology of sexuality. So there's a lot to say there. But in other words, the sexual is, and we just need to say this, and people are so desperately afraid to say it. The sexual is beautiful. It's this beautiful, stunning expression of divinity, right? And reality is actually making love all the way up and all the way down the evolutionary chain, right? And human sexuality is an expression of this much wider field of eros. Now, like anything, it requires the correct context. And of course, the greater the potency, the greater the pathology. We always know that's true. And in an evolutionary development, we know that the more potency, the more evolutionary level is obtained, right? There's a commensurate pathology. That's of, of course true. But, but the sexual is this stunningly, unimaginably gorgeous, right? Expression in which we actually stop asking the question of the meaning of life. Met in other words, in great sexuality that happens, you know, occasionally, right? When it's actually all working, right? We, we don't, you know, moments before explosion say, you know, what is the meaning of life? Right? Not because we've answered the question, but because the question's fallen away, right? Because we're in the self-evident goodness and truth and beauty right, of reality as we're embedded in the sexual expression of the field of Eros. So there's a reason that the lineage chose, this now answers your question, why didn't the lineage choose a different image? Why in the temple do you have two sexual intertwisted cherubs, even though the temple's talking about Eros? So clearly the temple tradition made the same decision. I'm echoing that tradition, right? And the, the decision was, why didn't they just have an artist painting? That would have been easier. You know, an artist with a brush above the Ark of the Covenant, right? Or, you know, you know, you remember that movie uh, that my dear evolutionary partner and homemade Barbara Marks Hubbard loved so much. She loved watching Chariots of Fire. Right. You know, when when there's this moment in Chariots of Fire, these two runners, when he's running and a particular song comes on, I can't remember the right, but it's a beautiful song. And you just you just step in. Right. You're in Eros. You're on the inside of the inside. Why don't we have a runner right on top of the Ark of the Covenant? But but no, the lineage chose not to. The lineage chose to engage the tension with the sexual. And, and when the lineage seeks to understand Right, the nature of sexuality, and we adduce these texts at the beginning of the, the book, right, the lineage talks about a lion of fire that lives in the Holy of Holies. And the lion of fire, right, there are two lions of fire, and one of them is the drive for sexuality. And the other is the drive for idolatry. But idolatry here means you know, the embodied sense of the, the tree, the astarte, the asherah, right, which, which embodies Right, a living divinity and that, that enormous desire to merge with nature itself that overwhelms right, the desire for wholeness that often 
overwhelms even goodness itself, right? Which is what the, the drive for idolatry is. Jung had a, a fragrance of this idolatry that he got caught up in and got lost in when he talked about, I'd rather be whole than good, right? And it's part of what allowed Jung to be swept by the German Vogue and at, at a bad moment in 1933 to actually do broadcasts for the Nazi party, right? Complex, right? You know, when you're, when you're, when you're taken by the field of homeless and, and kind of classical ethos kind of loses itself. So, so the tension with sexuality is important. And the notion that we should, let's not deal with that. And, and, and I mean, and, and, and if I can just be candid, you know, friend, you know, the, the amount of conversations I've had with people who are people that, you know, you know, or that appear, you know, also in your field and many other people that appeal in other fields, all of whom who are, you know, beautiful people and central thinkers and multiple fields and sexuality is at the very center of their lives and either getting it or not getting it, what they're, you know, you know, receiving or not receiving. It's the central concern, pain, right? Right. And yet let's not talk about it. Let's split that off. And, and then talk about all the, the, the central life issues. It's absurd. It's absurd, right? It's hollow. It's empty. It's the hollow men and the stuffed men, right? Gestures without form, right? Desiccated images of Gaia Kemeti sculptures. And so we need to reclaim Eros and the realization that the sexual actually does model the erotic. And there's a reason why the, the most sacred book in the classical canon is the Song of Solomon. And says Akiva in the first century, almost parallel to Jesus, all the books are holy. The Song of Solomon is holy of holies. And when you read the text of the Song of Solomon, in chapter 8 in a later book, Return to Eros, reads that text, the Song of Solomon is pornographic. It's not just your end, that's Liebes's points, Liebes's phrase. It's not just, not just erotic. Right? It's explicit right, in its sexuality, and it, it's the sanctum sanctorum. It's the ultimate expression right, of the sacred. Well, why? They couldn't find another image? Nothing else was available? And, and then some scholars say, no, 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 it's just a tavern song. But of course, they're completely missing the point. Of course, it's just a tavern song. That's the point. Yes, it's a tavern song. Right? In every tavern, what are they thinking about? What are they singing? They're singing about embodied eros, about the sexual, about the yearning for that moment in which right, I feel that sense of wholeness. So, of course, the most sacred text is a tavern song. That's the point. Right? And, and so the, the desire to kind of avoid the tension of the sexual right, is a desire to bypass meaning, right? to bypass reality. Right? It's illusory, right? It's unreal, and ultimately it gets ugly. Ultimately it gets ugly. Because in the denial of the sexual, in the alienation from the sexual, right, we then project our own sexual complexity that we've disowned and alienated, right, and our own sets of desires, right? You know, that which we desire to do at night, we protest against during the day. Right and right and so so all of that when we alienate from it, when we split off from it we project on other people, right? And you know ha having you know had some experience in being a recipient of those projections, right? They're, they're painful. So so we need to re-embrace eros, but we also need to re-embrace the tension, right? Of, of of the play between the erotic and the sexual, and this is not a a dialogue I know on the sexual, that's not our topic, we'll stay with Eros, but, but just to respond to that question, which was such an important question, because otherwise it would, think, it would seem like, yeah, well, what are you doing, Gaffney? Right? Well, why, why are you bringing in the sexual there, right? Is right? No, 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 that's what the lineage is doing. That's, that's the precise point. And it's why there's Yab Yum, right? Statues, right? In, you know, in Tiger's Nest, right? In, in India, right? And it's why, right, the earth and the sky emerging in erotic union, right, is central to, you know, all sorts of native traditions, right? In other words, this notion of Yab Yam, of the two cherubs and of the divine that emerges, the divine voice that emerges from that clarified place. And maybe I'll give the last example and we'll, we'll, we'll finish this, but here's just a, one example. So I don't know if you're familiar 
um, with this experience, right? I'm lame and we it's probably not the place to discuss it, but there's, there's an experience in sexuality called orgasm. That's what it's called. And it's a very erotic, explosive, you know, experience. So one of the things that we know is that the song of Solomon that we just talked about describes the text. It says in chapter one, verses, you know, three, four, right? It says, draw me after you, Narutsa, and I will run after you. Right? So draw me after you, meaning that the holy seduction in which you step in closer and closer, you leave the will of your small self behind, and then Narutsa, I will run, which is Ratzon, will, a higher will takes over. Now, so now you're in the, the four minutes, the three minutes, the 90 seconds, the seven minutes, whatever it is, or the half hour, right? If you're an expert yogi, but whatever it is, you've crossed the line, you're on the inside. The most beautiful conversations take place then, right? You, you, right? We, we commit to everything. Oh my God, I see you, you're so beautiful, right? Oh my God, I've missed you so much. Oh my God, I'm so sorry that I wasn't able to do that, right? There's these sacred conversations and then there's this explosion. And then in classical Western culture, there's a cigarette and a turning to the wall and a rolling over to go to sleep because we can't handle the revelation that just happened. We can't handle the authenticity that was just there. We can't handle the depth of beauty and goodness and truth that was there. But actually, right, in the moment of sexuality, we actually have a holy of holies, which is why cross-culturally in that moment, we cry out the name of the beloved. We cry out, oh God, and we cry out, yes. Those are the three words cross-culture that exist in all cultures. Right? Because it's a radical yes to the intrinsic goodness of existence. It's the realization that the other participates in the divine names. So we call it the name of the other. We say, oh God, Elohim, right? In every language. So, so, so the sexual does model eros. And in, in fact, the, the sexual bed in the lineage tradition is the reenactment of the Holy of Holies. So mitat shlomo. The, the bed of Solomon is called, right? The bed of Solomon, which appears in the Song of Solomon, is the reenactment, right, of, of the Holy of Holies itself. Cha. Right? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Mm. There was a vignette from my, don't want to say childhood, young adulthood that came up for me while I was reading this book. And it was a time when I was on a bus one evening. I think I was reading Kaufman's translation of Nietzsche's notebooks. But anyway, wow. this Kaufman this, did great, this, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, he was pretty good. Um, he brought it back from the brink. Yeah, he did. Uh, this kid got on. He had this brown suede jacket, and I immediately hated this kid. I, I, I inwardly, I was scorning the idea that he thought this was an attractive jacket. I was. I was scorning and bemoaning the fact that any girl would be attracted to this jacket, right? As I'm sitting there seething, it becomes apparent to me that uh, I don't know what he's thinking. I don't know what people who would be responding to him are thinking. I know what I'm thinking. If there's someone who's attracted to this jacket, it's probably me, um, right? So in that moment, it felt like right. in my inner vision, it was like knots being straightened out. Beautiful. And it seemed like, you know, jealousy was a kinked or tangled version of a desire that if I could just yeah. straighten the tantric thread out and find the positive desiring core, I'd be in a pretty good spot. And I was suddenly um, much more caring toward him as well. So you mentioned um, beautiful. The, it's a beautiful the ethical story. problem of the pseudo eros that comes from the unbearability of things. Um, but what's your take on the the ethical consequences and the need to um, have self-awareness of ourselves as desiring beings, like to to be aware of the fact that we are desiring as we desire yeah. rather than, yeah. That's beautiful. It's beautiful. There is a, I, I'm going to, we'll, we'll share stories, right? Let's, let's share stories for a second. So first of all, that, that's a, it's a very, very beautiful story. So, so thank you for it. And I'll, I'll give you a, a story from a little later in young adulthood, but I was in Barnes and Nobles on the Upper West Side. And it was um, in my younger, wilder days, I should preface, right? Um, but, and I was with my partner and um, we, we go to a shelf, right? Where I see a book, right? Um, in a particular section written by someone I'd spend, you know, some real time with, and I'd given a bunch of talks on uncertainty. 
And I realized he had kind of lifted all the material and put it in the book. And, and I was, you know, appropriately righteous. And I said to my partner, I said, it's fantastic. I'm so, you know, happy. He has a much bigger platform and the material is getting out. It's fantastic. Right. And, and she says, wow, that's just so noble of you. I said, yeah, no, it's great. Right. So then we, um, we were going downstairs and somehow in that Barnes and Nobles, and you know, this was before there were cameras, we wound up in the bathroom, right? Made love in the bathroom and then made it outside and, you know, waiting for the bus. Then when we get out waiting for the bus, you know, I say, oh, wow. Because I was in the middle of an experiment then, which I was doing with about 20, 25 students, right? And, you know, friends in which the process we were doing was to trace all pseudo eros back to its root. Meaning every time we had a negative thought or we had a flash of anger or right, we'd say, okay, what happened that evoked that pseudo eros? And this was back in, you know, you know, decades ago. And it's where I first started learning about pseudo eros. And I realized, of course, that my, you know, noble, you know, excitement about him having, you know, taken this material was actually covering up, you know, some obvious anger, right? I couldn't quite hold the anger because it didn't fit at that moment, age, you know, 20, whatever, with my sense of you know, my own righteousness, right? And so I'm with my girlfriend, right? And, you know, so it explodes in a kind of pseudo eros sexuality. And so I explained the story with great delight as we were then waiting for the bus outside, she was less than thrilled that I had just described, right, our passionate eros as pseudo eros, that idiot, that didn't get me far, right? But, you know, we were able to make up for it. We went home and to kind of transmute it and you could actually feel the difference in the experiences. And so, you know, this notion of, you know, pseudo eros always emerging from an interruption of authentic desire. And so, so, so this is very, very important. Let's just stay close to this. So reality is desire. Or another way to say it would be God is desire because God equals reality, right? And so if God is right, desire, reality is desire. If reality is desire, it's God's desire. Right? So there's a field of desire, and this is wildly important. The lineage expresses it through the four-letter name of the divine. And the four letter name of the divine in the lineage, names of God in all the lineages are another way of saying kind of the DNA or the substrate of reality. The name of God is the substrate of reality. So the name of God is, and if we had a, you know, when, when we, you air this podcast, if we had a little slide I could send to you, it's yud Hey vav Hey. It's a four letter name of God, right? The first one is as in Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. Yah. So it's yud Hey is Yah. It's the breath. Yah. And then Ya is a little yud, a little tiny yud. You pull the yud down and it's va. So it's yud hey ya va. Of course, we're familiar with yeho dash 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 va, which is the sacred name, which I don't pronounce. It's only pronounced in the lineage in, in the temple in particular moments. So the yud enters the he, the he receives the yud. That's the, what they call zivug matmedit, the constant eros or the constant fuck of cosmos. And then the vav, enters the hay, the vav is phallic, and enters the hay, which is yoni-like, right? And that is the aroused fuck of cosmos. So the constant eros, the constant fuck would be electromagnetism. And the aroused fuck would be that which emerges from, from choice, right? But the yud hay vav hay, that field of, is essentially desire as the field of cosmos. And that's the name of God is desire. Like, wow, that's like a, that's pretty stunning. Right. And so that means that if I participate in the divine name, I do that by accessing my clarified field of desire. I called this and I shared it with my, my beloved homemate, you know, at the time, evolutionary homemate, Barbara Marks Hubbard. Right. We, we called it your deepest heart's desire. So your deepest heart's desire, your clarified heart's desire, what Luria calls bearer clarification, the clarification of desire. Your deepest heart's desire, your clarified desire is the divine impulse, is the evolutionary impulse. And that's, of course, the third face of Eros. We very briefly alluded to the first four faces of Eros earlier. The third face we call the yearning 
you know, longing, right? We could call it desire, right? Desire is the third face of Eros. And, and desire is part of the plot line of cosmos. And so desire can't be avoided. It can't be bypassed, right? Right? It can't be limited and exiled to very narrow realms. Desire is everywhere, right? I was excited to do this podcast. I desired to talk to you, right? And in the end, if we didn't have a desire, even if there would have been multiple rational reasons to do this podcast, we wouldn't have done it. It's actually true. You can actually access a kind of first person sense. You know, how do we chat and say, ah, let's not do this, right? So there's, there's beneath and beyond the rational, there's desire. I'm excited to talk to Layman. It's like, oh, Desire. So desire is everywhere. And if I don't clarify desire, then unclarified desire hijacks the steering wheel of my life. So the only available word is to clarify desire and then to own the desire, right? Have few desires, says Buddha in the original Pali Canon, have few desires, but have great ones. And it's a beautiful citation actually with which I actually originally heard from my teaching partner at the time, Diane Hamilton. Dan actually cited to me that text and I, I looked it up. She had, I think, seen it in Stephen Batchelor, and who had cited it in one of his kind of um, more, you know, secular attempts to kind of recast Buddhism and his whole kind of, you know, writing project that he's doing there. But, but, but it actually captures something important, right? Which is this notion of, of, of this kind of pulsing, throbbing, tumescent desire, which is at the very, very heart of cosmos that lives in us, as us, and through us. So who am I? I am desire. It's right, right? Who am I? I'm a unique configuration of desire. So my desire is not layman's, right? And it's, I can't, I don't desire what layman desires. We might have some parallels, some shared field, but even that shared field, right? Our desires are reducible, reducibly unique. We share in common the uniqueness of our desire, right? And so to actually live in a way that's whole is to actually access the fullness of my desire, to clarify between pseudo-desire or pseudo-eros, right? And eros or, or, or complete or full or clarified desire. And then to have that desire be the North Star of my life. I mean, that's critical. The North Star of my life is not reason by itself, right? Reason itself is a, is a form, right, of, of gnosis, but it, it only is reasonable when it's in kind of interlocked, intertexted relationship with clarified desire, right? Desire drives my life and desire is not anti-rational. Desire includes the rational life takes the rational into account, but it's much more profound and much deeper. And really when we talk about things like, you know, Huxley talked about the evolutionary impulse, you know, and, and you know, Barbara spent her life, um, Gerald Hurd talked about the evolutionary impulse. So there's a whole, right, you know, um, um, the, the gentleman who did the, the polio vaccine, Jonas Salk, right, wrote early on a book called um, Survival, you know, Survival of the Wisest or something like that, right? There's this, so Barbara Marks Hubbard, Barbara picked up this evolutionary impulse and kind of championed it in her whole life and, and very beautifully, right? But the evolutionary impulse is desire. That's what it means. It means there's a unique, the personal face of the evolutionary impulse is my irreducibly unique desire. And when I cut myself off from the living quality of desire and I try and call it something else, it's another thing we do. So people talk about desire, but they, they seek every manner of name not to call it desire, right? Even Whitehead, right? He, he, would, he would refer to it as, and I only noticed Whitehead in this last couple of years. I only read Whitehead in the last year or two. And I kind of looked at process and reality in a whole bunch of books, right? Because I would give little talks and people would say, oh, I saw something in Whitehead that, right? So I started to read him. So he talks about appetite. The cosmos has appetite, which is, a Cambridge Englishman's way of saying in 1910 or 20, desire. It talks about the appetite of cosmos and desire is for value. What do I desire? I desire value, right? I desire presence. I desire goodness, right? I desire fullness. I desire a lot. These are values of cosmos. So reality desires and reality desires ever always deeper and more value. Okay. Now we're, now we're in a, a cosmos one would want to live in, 
right? I, for one, wouldn't want to live in a cosmos split off from desire. The answer is no one would, right? No one would, right? So, so to reclaim desire is to reclaim ethics. All right, that's plausible. Shaw! <laughs> Shaw! Let's do that. You know, one of the things that struck me reading this book is that it uh, it seemed notably more transcultural than soul prints and certainty and uncertainty. You know, the theme is ostensibly Hebrew Tantra, but uh, there's a lot more Greek and Buddhist and Hindu thought in this text than in the earlier text. And I'm curious about what that was like for you. Did you feel like you were in a more transcultural place and or did you feel like these themes were notably trans lineage themes? Yeah, no, it's that's a great question. Um, I, I think they they are to some extent translineage themes. They they appear in different ways, right? In different you know lineage traditions. You know, nothing that's a true phenomenology appears only in one place. You know, <clears throat> having said that, I'll say two things. One one general that's I think important. One personal, maybe not important, but but I want to share. So just first off, the general thing. It, the notion that all phenomenological realities are going to appear cross-culturally is precisely partially true. Right? And we, we kind of assume that's true, but it's not quite true. And one of the mistakes of integral thought right, is to distinguish between depth structures and surface structures. And of course, we mentioned this in a previous dialogue. It's not an integral distinction. It comes from the perennial philosophers. And the assumption is that the, the shared depth structures of the great traditions are the perennial philosophy, but the surface structures are, you know, social constructs, you know, sociological, psychological, historical, cultural conditioning, which is, of course, in part true, but, but in a more deep level, not true. In other words, each great tradition has a unique self, right? And that unique self is a unique quality of intimacy, or we might even call it a unique quality of desire. And therefore, it focuses, understands, clarifies a particular dimension of reality in a way that other traditions don't. So Christianity, for example, clarified beautifully forgiveness. An incredibly important word on forgiveness, you know, work on forgiveness. And, you know, certain forms of Tibetan Buddhism, you know, clarified higher mind states in a very, very particular way, which although they, they appear very clearly in Hebrew wisdom, <laughs> but it wasn't the focus. And so, you know, Hebrew wisdom, and Kashmir Shaivism in a different way, right? The, the root tradition of, of Hinduism, but which I'm familiar with only through secondary sources. So I can't comment on it in the same way. And there seem to be great distinctions, but you know, Sally Kempton and I would often say to each other when we first started, Ken Wilbur introduced us and we first started talking and we, we thought that certain Kashmir Shaivite sages were reincarnations of earlier Hebrew sages, right? Because there's such striking parallels, but Hebrew wisdom focused on Eros. It, 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 it hid that focus, but it's, it's at the very center of the interior sciences and it clarified it, you know, enormously. You know, having said that, you know, it does appear in these other traditions and I myself, and this is now the personal comment, I myself at that time was, you know, in this transition stage myself between a kind of a, a profound ethnocentrism, you know, and a you know, profound kind of world centric, cosmic centric kind of interior. And it's very, unless you've gone through those stages, they're very hard to understand. But when you're, you're living in an ethnocentric consciousness inside of a tradition. And when I was 24, I actually didn't really understand why you would even have a conversation with someone other than to be polite and lovely right, or to help them ethically, but why would you have a, a deep conversation with anyone who didn't have some degree of mastery in certain Aramaic texts in certain centuries? Like, what would you talk about? <laughs> As, you know, the world didn't make sense for me. Um, and, and I really interpreted the world through that construct. And it was that construct slowly breaking down, right, where, where, where I just realized it's just, it's just there's a scandal of particularity and that we can't Right, reduce all ontologies to be of service to the Hebrew ontology. And that's actually problematic in some fundamental ethical way. You know, but that was a gradual. So in the moment between soul prints and mystery of love, you very, as often as the case with Lehman Pascal, you kind of perceptively kind of felt there was a, I was in that transition moment. And, and in a certain sense, now I've come full circle, right? In other words, I stepped into this very world centered, cosmic centric place in part 
because the representatives of the lineage tradition and Hebraicism, you know, didn't engage in me in a way that was ethical, right? And so that was very, very painful, um, actually unimaginably painful. And, and now I've kind of come full circle to a kind of re-embrace of, of that ethnocentric moment. And, and so I, I never left behind my phylacteries or, you know, my kind of core, but I, I'm stepping much more deeply into it. And I, I you know, and I, I don't want to lose any of our time, but I'll just say I, I don't have words for how much I miss the lineage. Right. And, I, and I, I remain deeply loyal to the lineage, even as a, as I articulate structures which the lineage would take radical issue with, you know, in, in multiple vectors. So we have to remain loyal and in reverence of our teachers, even when we're fiercely disagreeing with them. We, we, we've lost the we've lost the reverence for the teacher. Right. We've lost appropriate hierarchies. Right. You know, um, Rian Eisler called holistic hierarchies, you know, famously. Right. Um, and, and so that that's important. There's an enormous eros in the teacher student devotion. And I maybe last sentence, I dream about my teachers all the time, you know, particularly uh, Rabbi Aaron Lichtenstein and Rabbi Yehuda Amital, two major figures who I studied with in Israel. Um, they both passed. Uh, they're both, I'm sure, quite angry with me. Um, and I love them madly. Um, I, I, mean, I mean, even adore them. Adore not in an inappropriate way, but I'm just, you know, and I'm madly devoted to them. Right? And and we're, we need to reclaim the blessing of the father and part of the blessing of the father is the blessing of the teacher, right? Not in its abusive forms, right? But just like we've identified sex with its abusive forms, we've, we've identified the teacher with its abusive forms. And when I say the teacher, I don't mean the guru. I have no room for, for the guru who kind of assumes absolute authority over all vectors of life, you know, inappropriately. So I, I don't, I think the guru model is dead and should be dead. Right. Having said that, strong teaching is desperately needed. And I, I miss my teachers enormously. And I, I, I miss having a master that I could go to. Right. You know, it's, it, it's a great missing. And even I'm, I'm privileged to have wonderful, wonderful students and colleagues. But I, part of the eros that we need in the world is to reimagine right, the eros of the teacher student relationship in a, in a new configuration. And by the way, Kirsten Zohar, who's one of my close you know, colleagues and students, we wrote together an article, um, which is actually appears under her name, which is beautiful on this new model of teacher student. So it's, it's very important. And thank you for, for evoking that. Yeah. You know, as you mentioned, lineages i'm i'm thinking of these chains of energy and wisdom transmission going back in in different as you know, we're discussing it you know erotic and tantric lineages from different cultures a hebrew tantra a buddhist tantra a hindu tantra a christian tantra all those sorts of things and at some point they kind of vanish into the mists of the past right. uh, and i have a lot of curiosity about that moment you know, I wonder how you think about, um, let's say, the Tantra of proto-civilization, how Eros is handled in Gobekli Tepe. You know, what, right. what were these, what was the erotic dimension of wisdom teaching 10, 20, 30,000 years ago? We don't even right. have names for those saints. Right, right. No, we don't. We don't. And, you know, and I also, you know, that's very, very important. Your, your point is important. And, you know, pointing to the Graber's, you know, you know, you know, monumental work that he was published after he died, you know, about the uh, kind of the dawn of everything, you know, where he, he points out that the the classical evolutionary lines, which seem to paint a kind of progressive growth to goodness, and they go in only one direction are, are, are flawed, you know, in some serious ways. And I think Graeber is, is correct. It's something that I've talked about with my student friend, you know, colleague and interlocutor, Zach Stein, for many years. 
you know, we've talked about what we call, you know, from the Hebrew lineage, you read that's a door up to the descent of the generations. So there's actually two vectors. There's an evolutionary emergence and there's a descent. There's a, a, a place where we move away from this kind of rarefied clarity and actually part of the, what's called, and we cite it in the mystery of love book, what's called the two lions of fire that reside in the holy of holies of the temple, you know, abutting or next to or approximate to the two cherubs, the one line of fire is the drive for sexuality and others, the drive for idolatry, but idolatry actually means again, in the hidden lineage, the public lineage is let's destroy idolatry, but the hidden lineage is, oh, actually idolatry is holding a dimension of Eros. It's actually unimaginably important, but that Eros, and this is a point that Graeber glosses over in the book, Right? He forgets to tell you that these beautiful ancient civilizations were flaying people alive and boiling them. And he mentions it like in a passing sentence as if it doesn't really matter so much, right? Because he's very, very concerned, right? To paint a certain progressive anarchic picture of reality. And, and he's beautiful. I mean, you can actually, so David, wherever you are in the next world, right? And I think he passed away during COVID. You did a gorgeous job, David. And so I'm just, you just, you know, there's some, you can write a write, read a writer and feel him. You can feel him in the book. You know, having said that, he kind of glossed over what essentially was the lineage's problem with idolatrous eros, which was its its dissociation from ethos, right? And it's you know, and that that a a a spark of that moment appears in the the citation that we adduced earlier from Jung, right? I'd rather behold than good. So this drive. So there's enormous explosions of eros, right, in the ancient world, right, and there may well be moments in the ancient world where you've got proto moments of what we would call modern ethics in the best sense of the term, which affirm universal human rights and, you know, all those kind of good things, but we don't see much evidence of it, right? And Graeber doesn't cite any good evidence of it, right? To the best of my knowledge. So there, there's explosions of Eros, but Eros itself needs to evolve. So what's happened, what happened was, right? Instead of Eros evolving, what happened is Eros stopped evolving because the force was so powerful, right? And so all consuming that there was this decision, right? To step away from it and to actually displace Eros for ethics. And in some sense, that was a decision of Hebraicism. Right? That's what the, the prophets were all erotic and actually yet they hid their Eros. So the Song of Songs in the lineage is actually used to describe the prophets but that's not known. The prophets actually publicly are railing against, you know, idolatrous eros. So there's this decision that we need to actually engage ethics first. And then, and then 2000 years later, now's the moment to come back to eros. And I think there were, there were two parallel decisions, Lane, which are helpful to see. One was the move into science and the other was the move into ethical law. Right, so science also is a movement away from, right, the living eros, right? So let's not, let's not experience the living eros of the ocean. Let's actually analyze, right, the ocean, right? And subject to, subject to all sorts of scientific, appropriate scientific disclosing, revelatory, beautiful, right, understandings. Let's not look at the tree, right, in terms of the Astarte tree or the Asherah, which is at the center, right, of many of the Canaanite temples. Let's actually look at the tree as lumber. Let's look at the tree as, let's analyze it from the perspective of botany, right? You know, before Michael Pollan, right, tried to return botany to, to the mystical while still, you know, kind of holding on to materialism, which was a, a kind of complex Michael Pollan trick, which I don't think succeeded, but it was a, a worthy and beautiful attempt when he writes about, about plants and in the animal world, he writes beautifully. So, so there's these two movements, you know, there's one movement, which is the movement to science. And the other is the movement to ethics without Eros. Right? And those are the two major movements. They're necessary. They're part of the evolutionary unfolding. They're part of the Hegelian unfolding. They're part of the movement of absolute spirit. And now we need to come to a place where we do two things. Well, first of all, we reclaim Eros as the ground of ethics, number one. Number two, we reread science. Now, this last thing is very important. One of the things we're doing here at the, the Center for Integral Wisdom, which has now officially been renamed the Center for World Philosophy and Religion, but it's going to take us another six months to get a new website up because we're 
we're trying to do the actual work and not get caught in the, the website stuff. But and we, we, we renamed it because we, we needed religion in the title. Religion is very important to be in the title for lots of reasons. But the one of our major projects is rereading science. And I've been working on this for six years uh, with a group of people that I've asked to, to play with me in it who've been very gracious. And I'm trying to quote unquote teach them how to read science. And they're, they're such good people that they're willing to let me do this stumbling attempt. And what they'll do is I'll say, here's a bunch of scientific facts. Now write about those scientific facts from the perspective of cosmoronic humanism. So which means, what that means is no jargon, right? It means we have to actually disclose what is the phenomenology that's happening underneath the scientific description. So I just finished with Venu Julapali, a 30,000 word essay, um, where we took cosmoronic humanism and systems theory and then tried to work them together. And Irvin actually, Irvin Laszlo sent me a bunch of his early books on systems theory, which are quite good, his 1972 book particularly, right? Not the popular one, but the, the, the real one. Um, and, and we tried to bring those together and now we're trying to bring together, you know, we just literally today, I was working on a piece um, on nucleotides, you know, the kind of the, the three forms of nucleotides in, you know, RNA and DNA. And so it was a 10 page piece where I just made, you know, a million notations to the person who I asked to, to write it up saying that this word, I don't know what it means. I don't know what that, what's a molecule, chemical reaction. What is that? Admit, meaning we're trying to get underneath the, the science, not to go backwards, not to go to the pre-science moment, but to go to an include and transcend moment where we actually can feel that science is actually an exterior descriptor, a critically important one of the cosmorotic universe. All right? So, wow. That's a, so, so there's, there's this moment now where we need to actually include science in a very profound way. We need to include, right, the, the emergences of ethics, but now those need to be included in a new story of value. That's what we're calling cosmorotic humanism, right? And it's only that kind of new story of value, which actually takes science enormously seriously, enormously seriously. And so I'm, I'm reading all the time in science. Right, like nonstop. I always have a bunch of science books by my bed, and I generally fall asleep, you know, reading them. Right, just get a get a sense, and I'm I'm reading science poetically. And so I'm now reading genetics, and I'm reading James Shapiro in genetics, particularly in his new book Evolution, the new redacted version of his book Evolution in the 21st Century, which is way too thick, um, but but it's an excellent book, and I'm trying to together with someone on the team trying to master that book, right. A weird thing to do, but utterly necessary. And so, so that's what we're trying to do. So I think, I think this moment of moving back to Eros, right? Post the dominance of ethics and science and ethics and science are parallel to each other. They're systems of law. We need those systems of law. Law is an expression of Eros. That was an evolution of an earlier Eros. And now, now we need to come to this new moment, right? Without which we won't I don't think we'll survive, meaning I think this new story of value is essential in responding to the meta crisis, but that's a, that's not the mystery of love conversation. Fair. Is that, was that clear enough? Yeah. Yeah. That was good. Um, you know, when you were mentioning lumber, I was thinking about this sort of, uh, the migration of Eros into chains of abstraction and that it has like a positive and a negative element. So, I'm in love with the tree, let's say. <laughs> and yeah. someone else apparently is not because they turn it into lumber. But they might be in love with the lumber or they might be erotically enamored of the fungible tokens from society they can get for that lumber, right? So there's this chain of increasing abstractions when you move away from the eros that ends in the object. On the other hand, that's what opens up new regimes of civilization is to be able to shift Eros into new territory that wasn't sort of given to us by evolutionary history. So it seems like that's got a, you know, a dangerous yeah. side, but also a really promising side. Yes. So, so this is critical, right? In other words, there's always a dance between the measurable and the immeasurable. 
right? So the move from classification to measurement, right? From Aristotle to Kepler, Galileo, et cetera, right? Generates modernity, right? In all of its, you know, Habermas's famous phrase and all of its dignities, right? And, right, the dissociation from the immeasurable generates modernity. Again, Habermas's phrase and all of its disasters. And so we need to actually dance between the measurable and the immeasurable. Now, if we approach a tree and we actually are, maybe, maybe yeah, let me just kind of recount a story for a second. I think it'll be helpful. I, and this will help us with our tree and with Eros. So, and with our conversation about ethics and science, we'll maybe bring it together. I was doing a, a debate um, and I think I have a recording of it, although I'm not sure, um, a video with a gentleman named Dennis Prager and it was 2006. And it was in LA and about a thousand people there. And we were talking about, you know, the relationship. I was talking about needing to evolve our relationship to the lineage and to articulate. I was already then talking about something to do with articulating a new story. And Dennis, who is a, a, a lovely man and a, a good articulator of some dimension of the classical biblical intuition, Right. And actually is formulated also in political terms, right? Um, through his work at Prager University. Right. So, so Dennis says, you know, the essential biblical point is that God is not in trees because the entire point is that trees are nature. And Dennis had just written an article called God is not in trees, right? That trees are nature, that the human being is called to transcend and control nature. So the reason I can make an ethical ask of the human being. It is because the human being is invited to and demanded, right, to control nature. The primary demand of God is ethical behavior, which is the core of ethical monotheism. And so we need to get beyond the kind of the kind of old or pagan notion of, of God's and trees. Right. And that actually is a, an important and powerful presentation of the biblical position and not incorrect. It's partially correct. It's precisely what we were talking about when we said there was this desire to move beyond eros, the eros of idolatry into the, the ethics, the primary ethical demand. That's beautiful. <laughs> the only problem is it's part of the story. It's true, but partial. And Dennis's mistake in all of his work is he takes half of a story and literally steel man's one half and straw man's the other half, which is how you create polarization. So I, I cited a text in the debate. It was a beautiful moment. And, and Dennis, to his great credit, was was delighted to be bested in the moment, right? Bested not by me, but by the, the text. So I said, well, let me cite a text for you. The text I cited was, Eitzim v'avanim elohut mamash. Trees and stones are literal divinity. So I cited it in English and he said, yes, that's an example of those absurd texts, right? And I said, yes, and that text was actually coined, right, right, penned by Shmur Zalman of Ladi, who was a major student in the lineage of the Baal Shem Tov and the head of, you know, one of the major Orthodox Hasidic movements in the world. And I cited a number of other texts in that regard. So I said, unless you're going to claim that these people are out of the lineage, which is going to be a hard move, clearly they're taking very sharp issue with your position. So, so what they're doing is they're reclaiming Eros. Right, on the other side of ethics, right, which, which is a critical thing that needs to be done, right? And that actually, at a certain point, the ethics don't hold anymore, right? So, and this is the key. In other words, you can say to a person, right, control your desires. Now, that's absolutely true. Everyone should control, right, desires that if acted out will be ethical violations. That's a given. That's part of the biblical moment. And the notion that, well, because reality is desire and desire lives in you, you lose the capacity of the homo amago dei, right? Of the choosing human, right? To actually exercise a dimension of control and to sublimate, to reconfigure, right? To direct that desire is absurd. That would be some version of the old paganism. But in the end, here's the thing, in the end, everyone loses the battle at some point for the control of some dimension of desire, unless they access the field of desire itself and are able to express their clarified desire in its fullest. There's no one who wins in the end, right? Myself, yourself, Dennis included, right? And unless you actually can access desire 
and feel that your desire is part of the field of desire and feel the dignity of your desire, right? When you do that and you live in the fullness of that desire, then other desires which are pseudo desires can be can be directed and sublimated and reconfigured and, and in the best sense of the word control. But if you don't access that fullness of desire, when you basically dismiss desire, right, then it doesn't work, right? And so when I approach the tree, let's bring it back to the tree and the lumber, right? Let's, go, let's now bring that back to your, your question. When I approach that tree, right, if I look at that tree only as measurable, as quantifiable, if I look at that whale, right, you know, um, only as, you know, that which produces oil, an example that my friend Daniel likes to give, right, right, it's a good example. If I only quantify it and I don't have reverence for the whale, I don't have reverence, you know, for the tree, then I can't actually even make a right decision for how I should relate to it. So first I have got to, I've got to be blown away. I've got to realize that tree is a literal divinity. I've got to feel the tree. I've got to feel the depth of its service in nature. I've got to feel the depth of its very beingness, right? And then from that place, from that realization, right? I can then now make a decision. Okay. So should I preserve the tree? Right? Or do I bow to the tree? Right? And ask its permission right, to receive its gift. And, and then I've got to consciously transpose the first eros into the second eros, and I can actually do that. I can actually now turn, right, to that lumber, right, and, and actually have this enormously reverent relationship to the lumber and absorb the Greek. There's actually about a, a man trying to, to, to do lumber properly, and in the, the kind of complex relationship to lumber is actually a, a sub-theme, right, in Cousin Zakas, right, in that work, if you read it carefully. So, so I think your point is, is actually gorgeous, right, which is that we don't want to lock Eros into a either Luddite with regards to technology, right, or pure you know, agricultural or even pre-agricultural natural world, that's Eros and everything else is anti-Eros, which is a position that seems to be taken quite a lot. There's quite a few books that actually have this kind of hidden retro romanticism. You know, um, um, someone gave me a book a little while ago that someone wrote called, uh, I think, Ascent to Humanity, not the original book, but a, 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 you know, a contemporary of ours who was writing it. And I read the book, I read about half of it, but it was essentially, you know, a retro romantic position, right? Agriculture ruined it you know, one way or the other, some version of that, you know, some, no, no, actually there's enormous eros in lumber. There's enormous eros in technology. You know, when I took three years off layman from kind of the, the teaching world and wanted to experience the world, you know, as an, as, as a householder, I worked with a technology company. I used to go to Apple all the time to infinity loop and Cupertino for three years. I'd fly in and I was, you know, part of a, an Israeli kind of investment, you know, kind of, you know, marketing team. And so I spent quite a bit of time in Cupertino and at Apple and at, you know, Mac shows for those three years. And oh my God, the Eros there was unimaginable. You know, it's, it was earlier days of Apple. There was this explosion of, of wonder and Eros, you know, that was just gorgeous. And the, 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 the Apple representatives were called evangelists for a good reason. They were aflame, right? It was this, this gorgeous moment. And, and so that, you know, Steve Jobs beautifully managed to transpose Eros into, right, the very fabric, right, of the product in Whole Foods. There's a clear Eros in Whole Foods. You know, um, I had a discussion at some point with, with the John, you know, Mackey about some moment in 2014-15 where, um, you know, Whole Foods was being completely unjustly attacked you know, for some weights and measures issue that clearly wasn't the case, right? In other words, the Whole Foods board, you know, there's an enormous amount of documentation of this were unimaginably ethical and just filled with integrity. And they, and yet they've gotten a little bit of a bad rap. Oh, they won't unionize. There's a whole set of kind of whole food attacks, which actually uh, under research break down. There's actually an unimaginably ethical, you know, you know, movement and culture. And so, 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 so some people in Whole Foods, you know, said like, so, why can't we get our story told? And, and I said to them, I said, well, walk into Safeway and see how much fuck you see there or feel there. You, you don't feel any fuck or Eros in the aisle of Safeway. You walk into Whole Foods, at least you did until they sold it. You walk into Whole Foods and like, I'm in Whole Foods. And there was an enormous sense of Eros, right? That kind of suffused, right? The entire, 
right? The entire sense of what was happening there. So food all of a sudden got invested with Eros. So what you're pointing to is so beautiful, which is it's our sacred stewardship and it's our conscious evolution that needs to actually liberate the spark of Eros, right? From the broken vessels and invest it, right? In, in the new technologies, right? Of, of all kinds across all vectors. But, but that's a very conscious and living process that we need to do as opposed to, actually, I don't see the arrows of the tree. I cut it down, right? And I don't see the arrows of the lumber, right? It's all instrumentalized. It's all I it. So thank you. That's a, it was beautiful to think that through together. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there was a section in the book called, I think, Dostoevsky's dad. And there's, there's a kind of twin set of questions that was lingering with me around that. Because on the one hand, what do you feel Freud was unable to understand in Dostoevsky when he begins to just probe reductively for the relations with the father figure? But on the other hand, how do we figure out which areas of our apparently sublime activity should be interrogated psychoanalytically? Yeah, no, beautiful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. You know, um, we had to delay our dialogue and you were, you were very gracious and I'm appreciative. You know, I had landed in Austin and right. My dear friend, and who's really a, a, an initiate into this world religion and a partner in trying to unfold it. You know, his dad died like, I don't know, an hour and a half after we landed. And it, it was like, what, do, how do we respond to that? And it's a longer story, but the, the phrase that I've been kind of hearing whispered, you know, the last, you know, years is, you know, the blessing of the father. And it was a moment in which we could have gone into a kind of reductive Dostoevsky's dad, Freudian analysis, right? A very complex relationship that Aubrey had with his father. And the only reason I, I'm willing to say that publicly is because Aubrey spoke about it you know, extensively in a, you know, a four hour podcast. So I, I wouldn't, of course, violate, you know, privacy in that sense. You know, it was, it was enormously complex and, and painful and, and a, a deep, unresolved father wound, you know, where there was essentially no contact for a decade. And it's a big deal. Right. So we could have gone down that route and that route is valid. Right. But there was something deeper, which was the blessing of the father. Right. Which was the, the, the energy of father that his father held and that that the father holds. And we, we've murdered the father. Right. And the father is value. We've murdered value. The father is the father. You know, we, we don't talk about our father in heaven. Right. And, and of course, we then generate a culture in which that which mass shooters share in common is a dissociated relationship with father. Right. Which is something that Warren Farrell's, you know, correctly, you know, pointed out. Right. And of course, I'm not I'm not talking about causation. I'm talking about correlation, obviously. And obviously, it's a much more, you know, multifactorial you know, set of issues, right? But, but the murder of the father is, is not insignificant. The murder of the father is the, the postmodern murder of value. The murder of the father and the murder of value are part of the same, you know, process. And so we need to, on the one hand, the psychology has been one of the greatest evolutions of Eros, right? And, and if, indeed, Freud talks about Eros with, with, with some depth and even occasionally breaks out of his materialism and his, his discussions of Eros. You know, and so it actually has allowed us a window into our interior, right, which was present in the earlier traditions, but not explicated and not put together in a, in a system. So Freud, Freud introduced something enormously important, but again, right, he made, you know, a classical, you know, mistake in which Freud reduced all of Eros to sex, right? What we need to do is up-level all of sex to Eros, it's a completely opposite move. For Freud, it was making, and in the end, he made a reductionist move. He said, all of this eros is really just sexuality, and sexuality is really materialist, you know, libidinal energy. What we're saying is that all sexualities, in some sense, even its distorted forms, right, is actually the yearning for wholeness, right? It's the yearning for eros, right? So either it's sexuality that expresses eros, or it's pseudo-erotic sexuality that covers up for the failure of Eros, but it's always in this movement towards Eros. So that's an enormous confusion that Freud made. And as he got 
that there was this intense relationship between Eros and the sexual, but he inverted the relationship and instead of actually having an aspirational relationship between the sexual and the erotic, he created a, a reductionist, you know, you know, wrong arrowed causation, right? Or, or, or a, a, a partial causation, but he missed, you know, the wider field. And of course, again, when we talk about Freud, just for the, the Freud scholars, you know, I understand that Freud is multivalent and has different levels in his writing, different strains. And so it's actually hard to talk about Freud. There, there are different Freuds at different times, but in the end, he got captured, you know, by the materialism, even though there were other moments, you know, Freud actually um, counseled the fifth master of the Chabad Hasidic dynasty that was called the Rebbe Rashab, right? So the, the Lubavitch or Chabad Hasidic dynasty, the fifth master actually went to Freud and Joseph Burke did enormously important work. Joseph was the successor of R.D. Lang and he wrote some really, really important work. He's written probably a hundred essays on kind of malice and envy. Right. I'm, I met him because, you know, in the 2006 moment in my life where I was experiencing a tragedy. Right. So, you know, a man named Zalman Schechter said, you know, I want you to go to Joseph Burke. And Zalman got a little bit caught in political machinations and actually sent me an indirect message before he died, kind of almost apologizing. But in 2006, he was he was lost in machinations. But in any case, he said, I want you to go to Joseph Burke and, you know, I want him to talk to you. And. You know, so and this was in the middle of the, 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 the false complaints that I experienced then. So I went to Joseph Burke. I didn't know him. Um, he was a you know well-known psychologist and again, who had succeeded R.D. Lang. And, you know, we did a, you know, a piece of like a week where he did this, you know, one of those kind of complex, you know, you did every, you know, every test you can do. And it was actually very beautiful. And, you know, he, he then contacted me afterwards and wrote actually a public letter saying, Mark, go teach. Like, this is nonsense. He was a very beautiful man. And, and I became afterwards and I got to know him a little bit better and looked at his work, which is, which is fabulous. And he really gets this, um, this relationship, you know, between these different dimensions in a really, a really beautiful way. And he, he writes about the hidden relationship between these two moments, between the Hasidic interior science mystical moment and between Freud. He's written a series of articles about this where he's, he's uncovered an enormous amount of new documentation that Freud was a more complex figure. So it's worth looking up Joseph Burke. He wrote another book called The Tyranny of Malice, which is required reading. You would actually, I think, Lehman love this book, Tyranny of Malice. Joseph Burke, he republished it as Malice Through a Looking Glass. He took over the Arbor House, right, in London, which Lang, you know, had started. And so he points to a much more complex Freud, but the surface Freud goes materialist. Right. In, in a way that's actually unforgivable. Right. And which which actually created enormous destruction in society. Right. You know, on, on, on multiple levels. And Jung was was trying to, you know, the good Jung, you know, was trying to correct that. So so there's there's there, there's some of that there that's important. Yeah. Dostoevsky's dad. Right. I remember that section. of the book. Yeah, that was a good. Uh, the name stuck with me. Another name of a section that stuck with me was courting the sacred, which touches on everything we've been discussing, you know, in a classic way of the sacred being conceived in this feminine metaphor. But that put me in mind, uh, maybe because I mentioned Nietzsche earlier, but Nietzsche has this passage where he says, you know, if wisdom, if Sophia is a woman, uh, then we may have reasons for thinking that so far philosophers have not been very good at understanding women. And it sort of raises this question of blind spots because so much of even the good traditions in these areas are are through the lens of male philosophical sages. How do we, uh, do you think that imposes a limitation of some kind? Is there some additional sourcing about the complexity of the feminine that needs to be brought in to get around <coughs> possible blind spots in that? That's a great, that's a great question. And um, Let's try and approach it from two different dimensions, because I think there's there's a kind of very, very important paradox and dialectic here. So so one, there's this enormous movement in the the best vectors in feminism and, and some of the more you know shadowy vectors to basically dismiss, right, you know, inherent distinctions between the masculine and the feminine. There's an entire literature like that, which is quite strong. 
then, paradoxically, these same writers are furious when a position is only articulated by men. But that's problematic, right? Because if in fact the issue is not man, woman, but the issue is, you know, qualities of consciousness, something which is beyond, right, both gender and sexuality, well then the issue shouldn't be man or woman at all. It should be what's the quality and depth of what's being expressed. So you've got this inherent contradiction in the literature where literally the writers are almost strangely unaware of the contradiction. A writer will write to a face, you know, any inherent distinction between masculine and feminine, and then be furious. Well, why are only men, you know, and often, right, it then goes to, and, and of course the great traditions are only by men, etc. So I just want to point to that contradiction, right? Number one, right? And, and number two, and it's true, right? And, and we do need women sages and we do need women judges and we do need women scholars and, and, and actually, although the inherent immovability, kind of the immovable feast, if you will, right, of the masculine and feminine needs to become fluid, and we actually do need more gender fluidity, and the transgender claim or the queer movement claim that there's more to me than man and more to me than woman, I'm more than boy or girl, and when we cry out it's a boy or it's a girl, we're actually covering up an enormous amount is correct, Right. And, and I've called that in this new book, unique gender, that I'm a unique gender. Right. So from transgender to unique gender, that's absolutely correct. Right. And, you know, and even though that's actually absolutely correct, there still is a matrix of both biologically and existentially and phenomenologically. There is something called the masculine and there's something called the feminine. And and we actually need them to both be represented. However, and here's a big however, but we don't need more masculine and feminine, we need more masculine and feminine at higher levels of consciousness. And that, that's a critical distinction. It's not about masculine and feminine, right? We need actually evolved masculine consciousness because pathologized masculine consciousness is massively destructive. And we need evolved feminine consciousness because pathologized feminine consciousness, for example, the bloodthirsty mother cultures, right, that are described actually by Graeber and others are all bloodthirsty and, you know, ripping out the hearts of, you know, thousands of women, quite literally, in order to fulfill this, this feminine yearning for merging with the mother. And so the pathologies, right, of the unclarified or unevolved consciousness of the masculine and feminine are both, right, disastrous, right? And, and actually, when you look at, you know, the worst dictators, of the 20th century, whether it's Mao, you know, or Hitler, you know, or perhaps Putin, that's a, that's a conversation, but actually they're, they're in service in devotion to the land, to the Volk, to mother Russia. And in Germany, it was between mother and the fatherland, right? It actually moved between in the images, but, but actually it's not, Right, the, the the pathology of mass murder is often not merely the line, right? Right, the masculine acting out; it's the feminine and its pathology acting out. Right, Mother Russia at all costs. Right, the great Mother Russia. I'm in service to Mother Russia. I'm in service to to, to the mother cult that's as bloodthirsty, right, in China and Russia as it was, right, in the original kind of forms that that get so ignored, and so. It's critical. Yes, of yes, we need women scholars, and yes, we need you know women mystics, and yes, we need women you know creators of of world religions. Right? We need the queen at the table, and we need the king at the table, right? and the king and queen live in each of us. You know, my my um, colleague Sally Kempton, you know, would often call me her girlfriend, right? <laughs> because because I'm I'm a little bit of a girl, right? You know, I, I have a lot of girl characteristics, you know, in, in multiple ways, right? Um, and I was actually just talking to someone um, the other day, and, and, and this person is someone who kind of presents and is a very beautiful feminine person, but we realized, wow, in like four or five major ways, she's kind of very guy, and I'm kind of quite girl. So it's a, it's a much more complex 
And, and we need to move to this new notion of gender, which you and I need to talk about, this new notion of unique gender, this new, right? That's actually, you know, completely critical. And we're, we're brutalizing a generation in the Western world because essentially what's happened is, if I can just say it in a word, the teenager rebels. That's the nature of the teen years, appropriately so. The teenager rebels against their identity. So, you know, 70 years ago, you rebelled against being Jewish. You rebelled against, you know, being Catholic, right? Then when that didn't work anymore because no one cared if you were Jewish or Catholic because society moved, then you rebelled against being American. You became, you know, let's say in the United States, you're, you're, you rejected America. But now no one cares about that. So the only identity that's left to rebel against is boy, girl. And so enormous amount of the transgender movement today is actually a simple rebellion against identity, but there's no religion to rebel against. Right? And there's no right state to rebel against. So you rebel against the only identity that's left, which is boy, girl. Now, again, that's one part of transgender. Another part is a correct, beautiful intuition that I'm more than boy and I'm more than girl. But both of those come together in very complex ways that are virtually impossible for 14 year olds to disambiguate, let alone for us, right? And they're, they're, they're hard for all of us to disambiguate, but, but impossible for 14 year olds to disambiguate. So now we have 14 year olds and 16 year olds and 70 year olds, right? Women, for example, cutting their breasts off and parents being almost coerced to go along with it, right? So there's this tragic confusion of kind of core, you know, identity, which undermines the very, very fabric of a culture. And so, so we need to, we need to address that, but again, not on the kind of my colleague, you know, Jordan Peterson, who seems to, I have, I don't track him closely, but at least what I've read kind of seems to reject the postmodern moment and to kind of reject the important intuition of the transgender moment. There, there's something important there, right? We would say in Lurianic thought, we'd say there's a spark to be liberated from the broken vessel. So we need to create new, a new story of value. And, and that this is one place where that's, that's enormously important. Yeah. John. Okay. Um, things like Tantra have a, um, an interesting relationship vis-a-vis -vis this notion of the esoteric and the exoteric. Right. right. Those initiatic things were often traditionally kept from initiatic. And even from the naked upper mainstream word. religion. Yeah, good word, right? <laughs> yeah, that's good. So there's Alexander Bard talks a lot about Dharma and Sutra, right? Like some things are not for everybody. I mean, there's dangers and subtleties involved in playing at the alchemical edges of the transformation of provocative energy. Um, on the other hand, we may be in a world moment, we may be in a civilization that's changing a lot of those things, that's crying out for certain forms of tantric wisdom. How do you think about, as a guy who's openly writing books on some of these things, how do you think about negotiating that esoteric, exoteric membrane when it comes to these topics? It's beautiful. I mean, it's a beautiful inquiry, like, like, like virtually all of your inquiries. So let's look at this for a second. Let's distinguish between... First, secrecy and privacy, distinction one. And two, between another way to say the same distinction between secrets sorted and secrets sacred. So in the lineages, there's always what are called baleha sod, the masters of the esoteric or the masters of the secret. Now the word esoteric, of course, plays with the Hebrew word seter, in English, mystery, esoteric mystery. Right, Seter, and the original Hebrew word Seter means the hidden and the destructive. Right? So let's look at what the word means, Seter, S-E-T-E-R, right? Mystery, esoteric, right? That, that which destroys and that which is so precious that it needs to be hidden. Right? And and you know, we, we need to really get the relationship between the two. In other words, there's a reason why, for example, in the classical lineage tradition, one does not study the Kabbalah or the interior science until one has achieved mastery in all sorts of other ethical disciplines, right? Because actually certain kinds of gnosis is destructive. So you don't have a consciousness to hold it. And that's, that's absolutely true. And therefore it should be held, right, in a place of radical privacy. Now, we've lost our access to that. We've actually lost our access to this 
this multi-tiered and multi, you know, valent vision of what should be shared and what should be revealed. We live in a culture in which, in which postmodernity says that transparency is the ultimate value. But of course, postmodernity contradicts itself because postmodernity also says that everything is context within context within context within context. Well, if that's true, if, if, if actually everything's actually, if truth is actually contextual, and if you just share a fact, then you're generally lying, right? Particularly a sexual fact, right? Because if you, sh you share a sexual fact, she slept with her, right? These two women slept together, this man and woman, this man and man, right? So there's the sexual act, but you have no idea what the dance of desire was. You have no idea what the particular field of ethos was. You have no idea what the, uh, the genuine power relations were. You certainly can't know it, as David Mamey pointed out in his play, Oleana. You certainly can't know it simply by formal position, right? right? Power is distributed in much more complex and interesting ways. So if we actually denude the fact from the, the resonances of desire and the resonances of eros, we share the fact transparently, we're generally lying because we're not sharing the context. And so we clearly need, right, the balea so We need hidden traditions where we can practice safely, even as we have to safeguard against a hidden position becoming a fig leaf for various forms of abuse, right? And here we just need to make a simple distinction between the pre-personal and the transpersonal. So pre-personal secrets are generally problematic. Right? The father says to the daughter, right, don't tell everyone that. Right? Obviously problematic. Transpersonal secrets where there's an enormous dignity to the personal, which kind of suffuses an entire system, and then there's a dimension of practice which is held privately, is beautiful and appropriate, and every tradition actually had a form of it. Now, now maybe one, one last thing is kind of helpful here. So when we say that the masters of the esoteric are those who hold the secret, the, the masters of the secret, you know, you can kind of get access to that in a very simple way. You know, generally when someone says, hey, I'm, let me tell you a secret. And the person says, yeah, I won't tell anyone. What they mean is they're going to only tell two people, right? In other words, people have a very, very hard time holding confidentiality. And people don't hold confidentiality because they don't have the confidence with which to hold confidentiality. In other words, the reason a person breaks a sacred trust, right, is generally because the attention energy that they get, the pseudo erotic forms of attention energy they get by sharing the secret, which when it's translated becomes salacious, is so intense, they can't do without it. Right? So one who, who's a master of the secret and can hold confidentiality means they have an inner center of gravity, right, which is interior. And so they're not always turning to the exterior right, for pseudo-erotic approval. And, and one of the things that the, the literature of power feminism points out is that one of the, you know, in the old world, right, to make a false complaint about sexuality, you wouldn't do because, because the price was too high. Today, it's the opposite. Right? The rewards are very seductive. You get an enormous amount of attention. You get immediate support. You're not allowed to be questioned. It's, a, it's assumed that it must be true. Right? 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 And the, the notion that you wouldn't believe a woman because she's a woman is, is considered you know, some sort of violation. So we basically identified the masculine with shadow and the feminine with virtue. Right? And so there's an enormous impulse today to actually believe the feminine and so the feminine or the masculine complaining gets an enormous amount of attention energy. And, and that's actually one of the factors that drives the motivational architecture of the system. And it's a point that's not my point. It's a point that, that Daphne Patai makes in her book, Heterophobia. And she's the daughter of Rafal Patai, who wrote the book Hebrew Goddesses. She writes a very, very important book. And Laura Kipnis right, has made this point in, you know, in her works and a number of works. And, and uh, um, I'm Catherine... What's her first name? I apply, uh, Catherine Hoff Summers. How do you pronounce her name? I'm saying her first name wrong. Kathy Hoff Summers. Kathy, I'm, I'm mispronouncing her name. I apologize. But there's an entire series of, of power feminist writers who have made this point. So I think we need to actually have places to practice safely. And then those places need to be safeguarded from potential abuses. Right? But we need those places. We need privacies. Right? We need the realm of the private. The realm of the private is sacred. 
right? And if we actually reduce privacy to a kind of surface transparency, we literally lose the depth and richness of what's possible. And maybe one way to summarize this whole little, you know, conversation or this, this, uh, this dialogue, or maybe this little rant I just did, right? If it had a little ranty quality, I apologize. But a simple way to, to summarize it would be every truth has its temple. Every truth has its temple, right? And that kind of, we understand that. Yeah, like that. Well, I could go on asking questions indefinitely, but I think we should probably bring it to a close yes. here. I think we've sifted a, a fair number of the themes and interesting features of this book, The totally. Mystery of Love. And uh, I, I, what, what nice we talking haven't with you done, as always. Yeah, no, totally. What, what we haven't done that we won't do in this dialogue, but I just want to at least with your permission mention it for the reader. Right? In essence, the first part of the book is the temple tradition. The second part is Eros. What is Eros? The four faces of Eros. The third part is the sexual models, the erotic. And then the last 10 chapters of the book are 10 distinct qualities of Eros, in which the sexual models, the erotic. And so we go from perception to imagination, right? To giving, giving and receiving lines and circles, you know, that which is done for its own sake time, union, and, and each one of those chapters is its own essay. It's its own world and, and, and helpful. So I would just invite anyone who's listening, if you want to access the Hebrew lineage sources on this, you know, there's a, a, a complement of about 40 pages of primary source footnotes. We're about to put out a, a new version of the mystery of love called Love or Die, Notes on Eros, right? You know, volume one, it'll be four volumes in which there's much more extensive primary source Aramaic footnotes that appear at the bottom of the page. So I'm just, this announcement that's there. And if you want to read something of this in a more evolved form without the kind of deep lineage sources, then read Return to Eros. Because Return to Eros actually emerges from this book. And what a delight to talk to you, my friend. What a delight. Thank you. Yeah, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> so many tunnels to go down to just from that last bit because I thought the stuff on imagination was some of the most intriguing oh, stuff. Right, we have to talk about imagination. The, that's that's the imagination, but we'll we'll work that's that into the next one. <laughs> we will. What a delight! Thank you, sir. Yay.